what were your main teaching points that you would take away or that you want participants to take away from the Institute? Um, the first, well, I was there to talk about my personal and professional journey with ITAP and with being a certified sex addiction therapist, which I was until 2012. I was uh, in, I uh, started it in 2002, uh, being certified, going through the modules. Actually, after two modules, they grandfathered me, and I was actually very much a celebrated uh, person in the um, in the sex addiction community. I'd been in it for 20 well, 25 years total by 2002, I don't remember how long that is, but um, they really knew that I knew my stuff, that I had been doing this a long time. I had written a lot about it. Um, and uh, so, so that was partly why I wanted to share my story because to be uh, treated in the manner that I was by them and to be sort of rejected um, from the community and ejected from the community after being somebody that was so um, you know, honored uh, was really upsetting to me. And so when I went there to the um, Summer Institute, I decided to just share as much as I could about my, my personal journey and my own experience. I'm sure that people in ITAP and CSATs may say, well, that's not how I saw it, and that's, that's good for them. This is how I saw it, how I experienced it. Yeah, so just quickly, why were you ejected or ejected from the, the insect community? Um, well, so in the beginning, so there was only SASH, the Society for the Advancement of Sexual Health. I was actually on the board for a while, and I was actually, it was called at the time the National Council of Sexual Addiction and Compulsivity. And the reason they changed it were that they couldn't get people to get on the board under that name because then, you know, they wanted other people than just therapists. So people would be attorneys or businessmen, and they felt uncomfortable. So they decided, well, let's make this SASH, Society for Advancement of Sexual Health, and then it actually sounded better and promising. I remember the people on the board thinking, well, good, we're going to move towards sexual health. This is going to be a different focus than the pathology that we've been focused on. So it was a good thing in many ways. And at that time, um, there were still moments on the listserv I belonged to uh, and I'm always active on. I'm on, active on the Imago listserv. I'm active on, active on ASIC listserv. I like it. I like to interact with my peers. I learn from them. I like to, to share things. And they would, uh, there, was, there were things that were homophobic or were what we now know as microaggressions, you know, p things said about the LGBT community or working with LGBT. And actually we had a, someone, I don't know how she got on, but it was a therapist who was a reparative therapist, an anti-gay therapist. This was in the early 2000s. And um, I didn't know her name. No one knew her, but she was met, saying things and no one was challenging her. And it was, they were, they were anti-gay, but they weren't overt. They were microaggressions. And um, I started saying, this is not okay. And this is, I don't even remember what it was, but I, uh, my, I remember my experience was, was that people uh, didn't necessarily love what I had to say because it was causing a rift in there, but they understood it. And by the time other people joined in, um, they got it. They were, and they removed this woman because we don't even know how she got on there. It was terrible. So I'm only sharing that because then it seemed to change as soon as, so then um, Patrick Carnes and Stephanie Carnes decided to move in with and, and um, attach with ITAP. So then there were two organizations and that caused a rift between the organizations. I didn't really understand all that. I didn't really care. I just thought the more the better and we're all going to learn. And so I, and I wanted to become certified. So I went in that direction and they were happy to have me. And like I said, they grandfathered me in and they looked at me as the, a, a gay expert, you know, somebody who understood LGBT and, um, but then over time, and then I was even invited to write a chapter by Stephanie Carnes in this book called Mending a Shattered Heart, um, you know, which I received no pay for, um, you know, all the funds go to her, go to her organization, you know, and that, that's not uncommon in our field, but I was willing to do that because it was important. I was writing about straight men who were having sex with men, and they really liked that, and the, the, the organization liked that. So I was, I, I was uh, revered in some way. Yeah. And then what started happening were... There were people, again, on the listserv, but they were known, who started to say some anti-gay things or microaggressive things. And they didn't even like me using these words. These words became antagonistic on the listserv, on, C on the CSAT listserv. And uh, I was seen as uh, an activist and uh, political, and I'm the last person to be political. I don't even understand politics. My husband has to, like, you know, give me the cliff notes of what's what's all being said, you know. But... Um, 
So, so this woman said, I'm going to take a risk. She said, I'm, I need to say this on the listserv, but um, I believe that um, homosexuality is a moral issue. And those that come to me for that work uh, who don't want to be, I will provide them with sex addiction treatment. So in other words, what she's saying is that the new reparative therapy is sex addiction treatment. So now we're not going to call it reparative therapy. So I kind of said that. I started out nice. I started to educate. I tried to be very, um, and I, it, it, and, and this is the other thing on the listserv. No one else would back me. There were other gay therapists. There were other gay friendly and informed therapists. Nobody would back me other than back channel me, but not publicly. Yeah. And so I started to be looked at as um, antagonistic. I was called divisive. Then the moderator of the group who is not a therapist, who should not be moderating a professional organization, because I, I ultimately said, this is a psychological organization, and this is not a religious organization. It's unethical for someone on this in this community to say that we, um, you know, that homosexuality is immoral, and that you know we know that from top, you know, mental health, all the mental health institutions, counseling, NASW, psychological organizations, it, you know, you know. So uh, it didn't matter. I was told by the moderator that people should be able to say what they want to say and no one should be silenced, except that I became silenced and censored. And when I went to other people that were in charge, they said, sorry, this is how it goes. We're, we want to have, a, you're seen as divisive. And um, I just realized, and I paid a lot of money. You know, when you're a CSAT, you have to go every other year. You got to go. They don't come to you. They don't do anything. They may be changing that now. This is four years later. But in 2012, you had to go every other year to keep up your, your um, certi certification. And uh, I would go to other therapists, and they just it just became very upsetting. And then I really, over the years, as I joined ASECT and became sex positive and sex informed, it started to conflict with what I learned in the sex addiction community. And also it was in conflict. Like, you know, to believe it or not, you don't learn anything about sexual health. It's not required. I've noticed lately that they're having sexual health, um, you know, programs that are special programs, but that's ridiculous. You're dealing with sex. You're dealing with sexual problems and you know nothing about sex. They know a lot about trauma. They know a lot about addictionology. They know nothing about not just LGBT sex, but non-normative, you know, non-heteronormative, kinky, fetish sex. And I started to talk about things like that, you know, like things like trauma reenactment versus trauma play, you know, and there was a few people were okay with that, but the majority were, were not. The last straw for me was um, that I, uh, in the certificate, in the CSAP program for me was, uh, this woman said, I, I never heard, she was religious, I never heard of somebody making an identity about who they are sexually. And I said to her, what I want to educate you around is somebody gay isn't what they do sexually. It's who they are inside. If I'm never sexual for another day in my life, I'm a still gay. I'm still a gay man. And um, I was then, of course, attacked by the moderators privately. I have all the emails from what she said to me. So I quietly left because it was very upsetting. I was very disturbed. It was very hurtful. I, I, I started to get into the community of ASAC talking to some safe people, but I was still on SASH. And um, I was on their listserv. And then the, the last straw for me there was, on, uh, there was a straight therapist who asked that we start to reconsider being affiliated which was, with what's called Sexaholics Anonymous. It's one of the four 12-step groups that we affiliate with, and they're on the website. And um, there was this big community uproar about it because, see, Sexaholics Anonymous historically would say you could only be um, healthy and sober in a, in a uh, marital situation, a legal marriage. So, um, well, now we can legally marry. Gays are able to legally marry, right? So that would leave us out before, but now, so I inquired because people said, is it really like that now that you can marry? So I did. I inquired and I got an email back from a woman that said, yes, we still see you as pathological. Marriage in our, in our determination is one um, woman, one man. So I took this email and I put it into the um, SASH listserv. And then people started to attack me. And I admit that I got, I did get, I became attacking myself. I was very upset. I, I was a lone voice. 
and I was banned. But I was, no one said how long I was banned. I'm like, I'm banned. I was banned by the top people who I, I used to be, we, we slept together, not sexually, but we were like in the rooms together when we were in board meetings, you know, go to these board things. We were like so close. Anyways, I just was so shocked. And I said, how long? And what's, what, you know, why? And you, and I got an email and I saved that too. You are seen as divisive and a threat to our community. And uh, we've, we've done polls and that's how people see you. So really, I, I was the perpetrator when really here I am being victimized and scapegoated. So you asked if I'll, and I'll end with this, you asked what was so helpful about the Summer Institute. I'm telling you, oh, and then wait, then I decided, well, you know, there's a Facebook sex addiction community. I'll stay with them. And they, they, I like the guy that was in charge of it. And, you know, he had like, I don't know, 200 members or something. And uh, I thought, well, I'll have my say here. Maybe I won't be banned. I'll, you know, there'd be more freedom. And he said, I'd like to offer you more freedom. No way. Um, I would link to healthy articles, sexual health articles. And one, the last straw on that one was a woman said, would you mind? Because understand that most sex addiction therapists are recovering from their own sexual problems. Okay. So this isn't just about clientele. This is very personal. And um, so she said, do you mind if you deal with these articles that you unclick the link that shows the picture? And it was a picture of a, a silhouette woman naked. You couldn't see nipples. You couldn't see pubic hair. It wasn't gross. It was a beautiful, it was a woman that, so I said, no, I'm not willing to do that. I don't, I hope our recoveries aren't that fragile and that we can understand from, she said, and she said she could have just quietly left, but she made an issue out of it. And she was somebody I was I was kind of close to online. She said, I'm out of here, y'all. Um, not here to have things like this go on. She leaves. The moderator of the Facebook group for sex addiction said, we have to talk. And I said, so we did. And basically, he didn't eliminate me. He said, you think about it. But from now on, I would like you to start to censor yourself and and so then I, I left. I didn't say anything to the group. I just deleted myself. So now I'm on a Facebook group that's pro-sexual uh, health, that's, uh, understand, that's moving away from sex addiction. And so the Institute offered me a great deal of healing. I mean, I shared way more than I'm sharing here now. And it was very, very helpful. And, and I got a lot of support. But really, sometimes I feel like I was a reparative therapist for 25 years. And I remember having gay clients come to me saying, their are clients said they were sorry, and uh, no, sorry, the therapist said they were sorry, and it was too late. And I, I feel like a little bit like that. I have a little, I have some shame that I was ever putting somebody at, at odds with their sexuality like this. Sounds unbelievable. I mean, what an unbelievable experience, like from the inside of what it was like to kind of be a part of the sex addiction community and how harmful it was to your own sexuality and to your work. Yeah. Yes. And, you know, I mean, I do, I'm not very, I can be very emotional. I'm married to somebody who's very logical. And I mean, I'd go to him and say, can you fucking believe what they, you know, if I can swear on this thing. And he's like, just, you know, write back and say, you know, he's very logical. Just say this, just say that. So I did. I, I tried so hard to keep my frontal lobe. But when you're told that what you're saying is wrong and bad and, and divisive, because I'm educating on facts of research around you know, sexual health and LGBT issues, it didn't make any sense. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like it, it, everything is really personal. All the issues are really personal. Yes. It very. Kind of attack on your personhood. <laughs> so what were your main teaching points at the Institute? What did you want participants to walk away with? I wanted them to know um, exactly how CSET worked. And I talked about all the ways I was trained and, uh, you know, um, what each module had. I mean, I only had two modules, but then what went on in the list. So I sort of shared the inner workings of it. Um, and I want, so I wanted them to walk away with also the, um, the lack of uh, information that was so obvious, you know, the scarcity of sexual health information that, that was not required to have by these people. And, um, and I wanted them to walk away with um, an understanding of uh, not really reconsidering ever um, sending somebody to a sex addiction therapist, who especially one who isn't trained. I mean, I probably wouldn't feel uncomfortable those trained in sexual health, like those on the ASEC listserv. Um, and some were there and they were listening to me. And that was so, what was so great about it. They could hear me and not feel personally attacked and hear my point of view and still have their point of view. There was a differentiation that, that CSATs 
and um, people in SASH can't have. Well, it sounds like the the people who are left in ASAC that are also CSATs, they're able to be in both worlds because they have that personal differentiation. They're able to see both sides, and that's important. Yep, and I was one of them, but the reason I couldn't stay is they rejected me. Otherwise, I'd still be in there, too. I would. I know it. Wow. <laughs> yeah. So were there any other things that you want uh, people who weren't there to know or any other personal meaning or value that you took away from it? Well, um, the only thing I will share a little bit here, not a, a lot, I shared one much more at the uh, conference is I have a personal story, too, where I thought I was a sex addict. And I, so I was wearing the, the label and that's how I got into it to begin with. And um, really, it's been the last 10 years that I started saying, wait a minute, this is what I like. This is who I am. This is kind of my erotic orientation. You know, I have a sexual orientation. I like men and I have an erotic orientation that involves a lot of other things. And there's nothing wrong with me, nothing. And um, as I started to do that, I started to, I, then I no longer could identify with that label because I was using the label to suppress myself. Wow. And like Doug Harvey, Doug Brown Harvey says, and Michael Bigarito say, I was trying to give myself an erotic ectomy. And um, so I talked about how I was doing that and how I came out of that at the conference. Wow. That yeah. sounds very painful. It was very painful. <laughs> I mean, erotichectomy. I know. <laughs> very. <laughs> wow. Well, what a story. I mean, I'm sure that the, fac the faculty had an amazing time having you on board to share all of this. So I'm sure everyone appreciated it and appreciate you sharing it with me. Thanks. Thanks for having me. And I hope that it helps people who are watching this. Yeah, absolutely.